Hello, everyone. Welcome to Silicon Dragon. Appreciate you being here. Today we have a terrific show, and we're going to be hearing from Northern Light Venture Capital in LVC, uh, both their Silicon Valley office and their Shanghai office. If you haven't joined us before, uh, here's just a little cheat sheet about who we are and what we're all about uh, and where you can find us. <laughs> you can find us on WeChat. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on YouTube with our videos. Uh, you can find us on this show. You can find us on our mobile app, our newsletter, our circle membership, all of these places. Um, and of course, my book, uh, I wanted to highlight that we have two new editions out translated editions, one is Korean and the other one is Vietnamese. The Chinese one is supposed to be here in uh, one week or two weeks, so I'll let you know. Uh, now, um, for all of you who are not familiar with our Silicon Dragon Circle membership, uh, this membership entitles you to our events for the year and our shows for the year and our networking for the year. So I highly recommend it. Uh, you can go to our website and click on Silicon Dragon membership, or you can go to Eventbrite and see our event listed there under Silicon Dragon Circle 2021. Or you can uh, go to PayPal and uh, pay at events at siliconddragonventures.com. Uh, so that's uh, my promotion for the day. Uh, <laughs> But um, if you're in Korea or Vietnam, hey, check out the new books. It's gonna be, um, uh, it's gonna be great out there, so thank you. Uh, I mentioned Silicon Dragon Circle already, so you know about that. We do have several Silicon Dragon Circle members who have joined us today. Um, I know Hal Kalman, Michael Jelleman, uh, several others who are um, online with us today. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you for joining us. And also I'd like to thank Invest Hong Kong for their series support as usual. Thank you, Invest Hong Kong. All right, now without further ado, let me uh, introduce our speakers for today, our Fireside Chat members, Jeffrey Lee, Managing Partner of the NLVC. Hi, Jeffrey. Jeffrey's joining us here in Silicon Valley where we've been having gorgeous weather, by the way, 70 degrees and sunny four days in a row. Fantastic. Sorry, all you East Coasters, uh, <laughs> or wherever you're zooming in from. And uh, and if you're still in wintertime, we're in spring here. Uh, the daffodils are out. The, uh, the roses aren't out yet, but the daffodils are here. Uh, from Shanghai, Fiona Yu is joining us, partner at Northern Light Venture Capital. She just made partner. Uh, so congratulations, Fiona. Thanks for joining us. Now, I would like to say a few um, remarks about Jeffrey. This slide is just chock full of information and that's just because Jeffrey has such an incredible background. Uh, now he's been with Northern Life Venture Capital for 16 years and he's worked from Hong Kong, Seoul, Beijing and Silicon Valley. Uh, he's the representative of the firm's Korea project, which I'd love to know a little bit more about, particularly with my Korean edition just out. Um, so Jeffrey, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that as we go forward. Um, now I, I learned that Jeffrey grew up in LA. Um, I mean, he was born in LA, he grew up in Alabama and he resigned in Atherton, which is not too far from where I am right now. Um, and I learned that you have some kind of role with the city, Jeffrey, with Atherton, um, like an auditing kind of role, right? Oh yeah, I'm on the finance committee and it's been an uh, eye-opening experience, to say the least. First of all, uh, thank, thank you for inviting us. We're so excited to be here. Um, we are huge super fans of you and Silicon Dragon and just great chance to meet all the members of your community. So thanks, first of all. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah the, the Finance Committee is great. We got to, I got to see firsthand the back end of how, the, how things like CalPERS, some of the institutions that really drive venture capital, how it works at the city level and the citizen level. That was really interesting. <laughs> so. Oh, I bet, particularly <laughs> during this time over the past year. Um, well, all of your educational background and your technology and engineering and mathematics and all this back background, certainly I'm 
came in handy, I'm sure. Uh, BA Economics, Harvard, MBA Wharton. Uh, he worked at Solomon Smith Barney and uh, in corporate finance and CMT. He's a VC in Korea, uh, two different firms. Uh, business development, two different firms there, technology uh, companies. He's a board member at several companies. Um, I learned that Jeffrey is an avid cyclist who uh, enjoys long rides in the Korean countryside. Wow, that must be spectacular, but you must have really strong legs. That's the way I remember uh, Seoul with a lot of mountains. There are a lot of mountains and it can get kind of windy. The wind is actually more scary to me than the, than the mountains. <laughs> Oh, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Jeffrey has a number of interests. Um, besides helping out Ather Atherton survive the crisis, <laughs> he's a board member of Habitat for Humanity, uh, the Murray Foundation, a vice chair of Associates Giving at Harvard College Fund, and a trustee of Crystal Spring School, which is uh, in Hillsboro, which is the next town over from me. Um, okay. Wow. Um, we're going to have a lot to talk about your VC career and what you're doing now at uh, Northern Light Venture Capital. Uh, so let me just uh, say a few words about Northern Light, uh, VC investing in early stage tech, uh, just raised two new funds, an RMB fund and a US dollar fund, uh, 300, uh, totaling 600 million, the two, um, investing in consumer post 90s, post 90s. So I thought about post 90s. That means 20 year olds. <laughs> Does that mean 20 year olds? Okay. It also means China going global, uh, which is uh, a topic I can relate to. I maybe not so much to the 20 year old thing, but definitely China going global. Enterprise sectors. Um, I like the way that Jeffrey described this to me AI 6G hyper-connected world, smart cities, the bones, the bones of the internet, I think, right? Jeffrey, is that what you mean by that? Exactly. Um, okay. you know, we like the pickaxes and the shovels, or if you want to use a healthcare analogy like I'd like to, it's the bones, so. Okay, yeah, I love that. Yeah, SaaS and uh, also healthcare. Uh, so those of you who don't know the history, and uh, gee, I remember some of this history too, because I was in Silicon Valley covering venture capital back in 2004 when Van um, Dong sold um, his, um, the startup that he was working at uh, was so acquired by Juniper Networks for $4.2 billion in 2004. You know, just imagine what that figure would be today, but 4.2 billion, I just remember that, uh, stands out in my mind as just uh, an incredible uh, deal. So uh, anyhow, this helped for, the creation of NLVC for sure. Uh, and they have definitely made uh, their way through China, uh, many offices in China, Shanghai, Suzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong. Uh, and they, Jeffrey, uh, you wanted to give some credit here to Greylock and NDA as special LPs as well, right? Yeah, they've been amazing to help to basically shorten the learning curve because Fang, myself, and a lot of the founding team were entrepreneurs, but we didn't have long or deep experience as a venture and fund investor, and they've been really invaluable. Of course, they okay. helped us out a lot at the beginning with introductions to limited partners who are still with us today. Super grateful. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, well, before I go forward with more questions on, on the venture capital side, let me just bring in Fiona Yu from Shanghai. And uh, Fiona is uh, a partner at the firm. And she has been with the firm uh, for quite some time, uh, started as an intern and has worked her way up the ladder. So that's wonderful experience. Uh, she uh, knows healthcare inside and out um, and tells me that China is a big opportunity and this is the top sector in China right now. She's a former sales manager at J&J in Beijing, a strategic planning manager at Eli Lilly in Shanghai a consultant at Deloitte uh, before that. Uh, so it's quite a career. She was born and grew up in Shandong. Uh, she has a bachelor in computer software engineering from the Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Wow. Um, okay. And she has an MBA from Duke. So in her limited spare time, which I imagine she doesn't have much of, is skiing and scuba diving. 
Okay, now, um, now comes the fun part where I stop talking uh, and we dive into our questions um, and answers. So let me just kick things off. We did get a, a preliminary question uh, from one of the uh, viewers today, and they wanted to know how you source your deals. How does Northern Light Venture Capital source your deals in Shanghai and Silicon Valley? Uh, so Jeffrey, why don't you lead off with that and then and let us know. Sure. Um, well, today we're we're pretty fortunate to feel like we have a bit of a flywheel, particularly in at least actually pretty much all three of our sectors. We do consumer, enterprise, and healthcare. And so that flywheel talks about repeat entrepreneurs, um, people that we know in the ecosystem that are have been part of the venture industry for the last 15 years that we've been around. But it all started with the DNA of where Fang, myself, and the co-founders came from. Uh, which uh, at the beginning, albeit was heavy on semiconductors, on network equipment, on enterprise side. And then um, I guess a few, a few of the big themes would be the returnees. We are a big, big fan of the returnee wave that started in the late, I guess it actually emerged in the 2000s, but these amazing um, super energetic and visionary entrepreneurs who for some for whatever rhyme or reason made it to the US to mm -hmm. Duke University for an MBA, to Silicon Valley to work at Intel, um, and then decide that they, their passion was to focus on China. Um, today, I would say that uh, we like referrals. Um, it is an, it, I don't think we're the only one to do that in Silicon Valley or in China, but even though we try to get our name out there and be very accessible, we do like it if we can be introduced to somebody, even if it's, it doesn't have to be someone senior, but somebody that we, as at an organization that we trust, and so by association, we can feel that, oh, we can jump in much quicker and much deeper. Fiona? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, um, I agree with what Jeff uh, said, uh, whatever, uh, uh, no matter in Silicon Valley or in Shanghai, high level, the firm will do some PR uh, and let people know what we want to do and what we're good at. And everyone just just refer to the or, or introduce people who are going to start their own business. But at uh, individual investor level, we want everyone had their own network and domain expertise. They uh, source the deals um, uh, in their network, not only from the public conference or events. That's everyone. That's what everyone could do, right? We want everyone have their own network, get the high quality uh, referral deals. For example, if you invest in. Uh, and in the company, and you have good relationship, uh, long-term good relationship with the CEO, they definitely refer the deals around uh, his circle, uh, which possibly very high quality deals rather than the source of the FA or the conference or the events. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a evolving and rolling uh, business. Um, at first, uh, it's pretty hard, uh, probably uh, difficult for a entry-level investor, but you keep doing it, you keep building your network and uh, expertise. You have your name in the industry and you have a name under the umbrella of a Northern Light. So you have your own circle, which is very, uh, very valuable and, um, and uh, long-term going. Right, so during COVID, has it been easier or harder uh, to source deals? Uh, Jeff, you go ahead first and uh, uh, something in China. Um, it's been easier. It was really harder in the beginning, but it became easier. I would talk about the outside of China experience. I think Zoom has really become a, an accelerator to make it easier to get a referral, to have initial meetings and follow-up meetings on this platform. Mm -hmm. I would hand off the mic to Fiona, but as, as you know, Rebecca, things kind of turned back to normal pretty quickly last spring in China. So I'll yeah. pass the mic over to you about COVID, Fiona and deal flow. Yeah, so um, actually um, people got uh, um, uh, nervous about, about how we working as investor in the spring, uh, right after COVID, we can't travel, we can't even uh, commute to our offices. But you know, we, we live on WeChat a lot in the past like, like eight years. So usually we got our network first from WeChat, not face to face. So people are just uh, adjusting the work style very quickly. Uh, I remember in the March and April, um, we rely on WeChat and, uh, and Zoom for calls. 
uh, I think it's not um, um, obviously easier or more difficult uh, um, at first, but uh, the good thing is um, um, both our investor and entrepreneurs are uh, getting used to talk on WeChat or, uh, or Zoom. Or, uh, that's a good thing for COVID, which makes our life a lot easier uh, from efficiency side. Um, but still, I personally feel we still need to talk to people face to face. It cannot be, re be replaced totally by Zoom calls. Um, that's probably because we're back to normal pretty much after May. Um, I, uh, I traveled uh, uh, less than, I traveled uh, less uh, uh, than the previous years. Uh, I mean, last mm -hmm. year, I still travel a lot. Uh, I still need to meet people uh, uh, face to face. <laughs> Inside uh, China, inside China, you're traveling. Yes, inside yeah. China. Okay. And Jeffrey, uh, with, we were talking a little bit beforehand. You said uh, you know, sometimes you'll do um, get to know an entrepreneur a little bit better by taking a walk with them around here. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, albeit, as you said in the introduction, I've been hopping around a lot of cities. You know, before COVID, I usually uh, spend two weeks a month, sometimes three weeks a month on the road, mostly in China. So maybe that's my excuse, but I have met, I have discovered so many amazing, um, I don't know, uh, nature preserves, wetlands, just areas around the bay and in the in the hills of I guess Silicon Valley. But my advice is, well, personal advice is I don't know if you've heard about the news in the East Bay about the coyotes, but I wouldn't go in early in the morning or at dusk, as long yeah. as you avoid that. Yeah. Yeah, there's one coyote. Apparently, he's not afraid at all, and they'd come up and bite you. And there's been several incidents. Uh, right. So I haven't seen any in my neighborhood. <laughs> Not yet, anyhow. Uh, but yeah, there's always surprises out here. Like, uh, don't go hiking by yourself. And you know the uh, the um, what do they the not the wild lions the um, uh, what do they call those? Uh, what mountain lions? Bobcats. The mountain Ooh. lions. The mountain lions. Yeah. You no, know, you know, Rebecca, this started for me. Um, at my, you know, you introduced me a second ago, and I was at a chip startup that got bought by Agilent. And that division is now part of, is actually the cash cow of Broadcom. And it's, uh -huh. for those of you in the Silicon Valley community who knows, it's off of North First Street and Trimble Road in North San Jose. And my boss, who until recently was actually the president at Samsung Electronics, he made us take a walk around the big San Jose block and he said, you better be ready to say what you want to say and be finished by the time we finished a circle. And so it was a great exercise for me to learn to be very focused in a conversation because when that walk is over, it's over and the meeting's over. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So speaking about focus, what, what is the main point that you want to get across today? Jeffrey, oh, you, um, yeah, what, what do you want us to know about what you're doing? Uh, we want to get the point across that we are after, even after 15 years, going to 16th, um, especially for those who haven't heard about us as much, we are continuing to be super passionate about early stage. We don't have fear about the lack of revenue. We don't have fear about the lack of incorporation. I'm not saying that we're a seed stage fund. We definitely like to roll up our sleeves and be the first institutional investor to be the best friend of the entrepreneur. I would say to many of the Silicon Dragon audience in Asia, especially in China, a huge point is that we like to be behind the scenes. For those of you who know my partner Fang or in China, they'll call him Deng Feng. He really uh, likes to stay out of the limelight. We don't like to tell people that that's our company or that's my company. We like for it to be the other way around. And I have to give credit, not just to the background of, of my partners like Fiona, but also firms like Greylock and NEA. Uh, for whatever you know, people know about these firms, they have taught us from 2005 that you really want to be the, the people behind the stars. The stars are the entrepreneurs. Okay. So when they go public, it's them. It's the founder who's up there who rings the bell, right? Rings and the gong. Uh, if you've seen those Shanghai gong. A-share gongs, they're huge. They're like... Yeah, or the gong, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the VC is there, but it's the spotlight is on the founder and the founding team. Uh, so... Um, so I know um, you've had a lot of really good deals, Jeffrey. I mean, what one stands out in your mind as your top deal ever? Um, for the firm, um, you know, albeit it's not the area we've prioritized as number one, our most, um, our most 
memorable deal, a number of different, uh, number of different dimensions is probably May Tuan. And May Tuan is a firm that we first met. Uh, Wang Xing, the CEO, uh, he was number three or number four in the group buying craze. This was his, I think his fourth startup and the previous three were, as they say in Chinese, uh, or at least for a foreigner like me, Mama Hu Hu. So the, the previous three weren't that great, but that didn't phase us. Um, you know, you asked us earlier, Rebecca, about our network. Uh, Wang Xing is a, a Tsinghua person, Tsinghua University. And several of my partners, including Fang, are very uh, Tsinghua-esque, which has its own baggage, which we can't talk about on this fireside chat, but it's a well-known thing. Um, we were super lucky to meet him, meet Wang, to meet Xing. Um, super surprised, to be quite honest. We were always biting our nails every year, wondering if they were going to make it. Um, and, you know, uh, 100 million, this is pretty public knowledge, so I'll just say 100 million became 2 billion, this company value became 3 billion, became 7 billion, became 15 billion, Wow. 20 something billion, then we were just like, okay, this is getting crazy. <laughs> and then uh, the company went public at around 50 billion, and now I think it's north of close to 300 billion US. Wow, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, but it's all him. We cannot take credit, except that maybe in 2010 and 2011, we looked at the person and his vision at face value and not, uh, you know, all that thing that, you know, when you watch a Charles Schwab or a Goldman Sachs commercial on TV, past performance, past results do not indicate future performance. Yeah. I think that means a lot for entrepreneurs. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so about Tsinghua, uh, some people on the uh, on this Zoom might not know about Tsinghua, so just say a few words about it. Tsinghua University, uh, well, you know that um, Fiona and I, Fiona went to Duke and I went to Wharton, so I'll say this as unbiased as I can, as if Feng was saying it, but Feng would say Tsinghua is the MIT and Caltech and Stanford of China. Uh -huh. A little bit of hyperbole, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, but it's clear it is one of the top three or top two universities in China. Um, right. It's definitely the most engineering and tech focused. It is, um, it is, oh, uh, well, I, we shouldn't go there, but you know, it was uh, based on a grant by the US government. The US government gifted the don initial donation that started Tsinghua University. I don't know if people know that. Oh, interesting. <laughs> we oh. don't want to go there because it has to do with something called the Boxer Rebellion. So let's not go there. Oh, oh I, okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, well, we, we want to be uh, accessible, you know, worldwide. Our Zoom should be accessible worldwide. So we yeah. want to continue that <laughs> tradition. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so, um, oh, interesting. Uh, so we have a comment from Chris Bailey to all panelists. The president of Tsinghua is a, oh, he just is a, uh, he's, he moved it away, so. Okay. Oh, is a ministerial level position. It is first amongst equals. Thank you, Chris, for saying that. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So let, let's move a little bit into technology sectors. Uh, what, what interests you today besides the healthcare segment uh, and the 20 year olds and the China going global and the enterprise SaaS? Uh, are they all equal or are they, uh, is there uh, a sector that stands out? It's a lot. I mean, you just gave us enough that keeps us from getting enough sleep every night, but we're super excited. Um, I would love to, you know, Fiona, why don't you start off and tell us like the one or two things that are per perhaps the most exciting things that you see in your practice in healthcare that you've just run recently or about to go out to market or something you're really excited about right now? Yeah. Uh, sure. I, um, I talked something um, uh, about healthcare and uh, Jeff will talk about the, the, the post 90 things and uh, which just seems Rebecca's very interested about. Um, so healthcare <laughs> is definitely a, a very a, a good peak in the past uh, five years, I think in China. Uh, our firm started to uh, enhance our healthcare investment, um, I think seven, uh, six years ago, which when we see the clear signal uh, in China's market. Um, I, I, I don't want to go deep in the background of the microeconomics thing about healthcare, which probably our audience have uh, known a lot, uh, the government support, the lack of the infrastructure thing. 
I, um, I want to say something about the uh, innovation of the technology, uh, which brought uh, heavily by the uh, Western trained returnees in China. And uh, the uh, ecosystem supports the innovation of the biotech industry um, from the primary market side, uh, uh, talent side, and the access side from the uh, secondary market. For example, um, uh, we launched some um, um, the new board uh, in China called Star Board, Hong Kong mm -hmm. Exchange, which supports the access of the non-revenue, non-profit, biotech and medtech companies, which is a very first thing happening in China. And uh, last year during the COVID, uh, the uh, people paid much more attention to the healthcare building um, and uh, the industry growth uh, from the public side, uh, which also uh, gives a lot of support and the capital, a lot of capital support and uh, not from primary market and secondary market as well. And yeah, but, but, but the foundation of that is that we have the talented, we have the uh, talented people who want to do their business, who, who want to do uh, innovation uh, in China. Uh, that's give us a, a give the investor a lot of opportunities. All right, so we have a comment here from Chris. He says that the VCs that he's encountered in China in the healthcare space that they're pretty risk averse. Um, that they will invest in companies that already have U.S. FDA approval. Very few will look at earlier stages. Is that your experience? And is there a reason for that? Um, I'll, Jeff, I'll, I'll take the question if you have something to add. Uh, you could yeah, I think it's directed to you because it's China healthcare. Go for okay. it, Fiona. Yeah, uh, I'll say uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, it depends on when that happens. Uh, uh, as I just said, the China healthcare uh, investment has been uh, growing really fast in the past uh, five, six years. Uh, people are always were cautious to about risk at first. You know, they want to see the path of the growth. The, the, the they want to see the path of how company grows and uh, exit. Uh, so, awarding early stage or uh, non-approval products or companies is the is a, a common way to to do that. But things has been changing really fast. Uh, in the past years, especially we see some exit opportunity um, uh, and in starboard Hong Kong exchange and, uh, and NASDAQ for mm -hmm. China, China companies. Everything changed really fast in China so in general. Uh, yes. So we, can, yeah, we cannot see, uh, see a problem in a universal way across the years. But uh, that's a part of the yes. The no thing is uh, it depends um, um, for different firms. For our firms, for example, I cover Medtech uh, in our firm. Among the almost the 30 portfolios, I think when we invest them, 80% uh, of them are has no uh, CFDA approval or FDA pro products. Uh, that's, that's linked to the points uh, Jeff just mentioned, we do early stage. We do, uh, we do early stage, we invest in early stage uh, technology. Um, we uh, definitely don't say ourselves as risk adverse, but I also don't want to see, uh, say ourselves as risk taking, which is, sounds terrible as well. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, it depends to different firms. I'm confident that more and more investors in China tend to uh, try um, um, early stage, uh, more risk, risky uh, investment now compared with, uh, I would say, three years ago. Okay, so um, well, let me ask you, um, because I know you, your firm has a couple of China IPOs coming up. Um, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't have let that slip, but <laughs> I, I, think, I think this is the case uh, in China that you've got a couple of healthcare companies about to go public. public. And so uh, that's pretty interesting. And it, it makes me wonder about, how the uh, VC's performance is China compared to the US, which has been the better market for you, China or the US or maybe Korea? <laughs> uh, Jeffrey, uh, from your global perspective, what do you think? Well, you know, if you take out like, like, you know, some amazing stuff in America like Tesla Motors, then I think it's bar none, the Chinese stock markets are better than the US markets. And for, uh -huh. well, China plus Hong Kong. So Northern Light has had its best returns 
definitely post IPO. If you take a three year period post IPO, China and Hong Kong, Shanghai, Shenzhen and Hong Kong have have just been tremendous. We've seen um, 5x multi increases in multiple companies that have gone public in China, uh, 5x increase in the market cap. I will say though, Rebecca, that part of that, as many people know, in China, at least, even though uh, revolutionary, a few years, a couple of years ago, the government changed from an approval based system to a US style registration based IPO process, mm -hmm. still to protect, um, I guess, the citizenry, the IPOs are 10, they tend to be a little bit lower in valuation than they could be in terms of market. So that kind of explains part of it, but it's been amazing. Um, and this huge sea change, as I mentioned to you before, we have been blessed and fortunate to be involved in the, literally the forefront of some amazing changes. We were involved in the first biotech IPO in China two years ago, Zelligan went public and that was pre-IPO, um, I'm sorry, it was pre-revenue. It was a pure biotech, like a US style IPO, wasn't even thinkable in China and that went public on star market, very, very successful for us. Last year, we were involved with the first China depository receipt CDR, and that was Segway Ninebot. That was a Cayman Islands company that listed receipts on the Shanghai star market, which is you know incredible if you think about that that's even possible so fast. Yeah, yeah no, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, so it, it has grown up very fast, the whole China VC market, but of course there's been a lot of friction in the past couple of years with the US uh, uh, side of it. And how has this friction uh, changed uh, your strategies toward uh, US and China and Asia investing? Well, first and foremost, we, we care, we're private investors, we're private citizens, but we care about both countries. If we just look at the United States, we look at China. Um, I'm a US citizen, uh, a number of my other partners are as well. Um, we love both countries, we love the, positive value to society that entrepreneurship and innovation has. We're very, very happy and eager to stay away from what are national security concerns of both countries and both peoples and political systems. We're happy to stay away from those things. Okay. Okay. So what has changed, Rebecca, um, and I would say has gotten a little bit better with the current Biden administration, but what has changed is we're very, very cognizant with our, with our partners, our other VC firms, co-investors and entrepreneurs that if there is an amazing technology or service in Silicon Valley or one in Zhongguanchun, we're very careful about being thoughtful and intentional about how it goes global. Certain things are a red line and we're not going to go there. Personal data, data in general, health data, genomic data, it's IT and healthcare. We just want to stay away from things that make people uncomfortable. There's still a huge ocean and multiple oceans of work of opportunity, regardless of those op options. Okay, can you talk about the Korea project? What is that? Um, Korea project is a small initiative, um, you know, that we just look at the modality of, of China and Silicon Valley, and we see that it's very easy to look at that lens, those two lenses, and see this very explosive opportunity coming out of South Korea. I personally like it more from a global context, is if you look at the population of a small country and a company like Hyundai Motor or Samsung, you see the very huge global footprint. And so that's how we look at it. But it's very um, small right now. It's a project. And we use the word very uh, thoughtfully at this point, but super exciting so far. And we're not involved with it, but a lot of our friends um, have been very successful in the Korea space. Mm -hmm. And so we just look at that with great admiration and see how we can be helpful with our core mission, early stage, technology focused. We think China is huge. If there are ways that we can find and back entrepreneurs that can be helpful and additive to our mission, that's really a good idea for us. Okay. Well, can you talk about a new deal that you've just done? Because I, I know you just had you just had one this week, uh, right before, I think, yesterday. Uh, we, so what was, what was that deal all about? Yeah, we just recently closed. Um, we actually have a lot of new closings, but we just closed a new... Um, a new financing, I think, in healthcare. Fiona, do you want to talk about one of our recent closings? Um, we have a lot of uh, follow-on yeah, investing one. by our portfolio companies. Um, yeah, the joke the joke is is that um, many of them come from a lot of our competitors. But um, 
Uh, how many deals did you do last year? How many, uh, how many new deals, how many follow on deals? Uh, we did about, about 12 new investments last year. And I think uh, there was half, just, half US, half China, or how was it split? Uh, I would say that uh, two thirds of those were China and one third were based in the US. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we, we actually have, uh, I would say one thing is that healthcare more than any other sector is, is relatively borderless. When you kind of build and, and build that flywheel, you see the deal flow and the network that applies to both countries. Right. And well, so certainly doing... with uh, the news about the vaccine, do you have any of these uh, companies that are working on the vaccine? We time? don't. Um, we don't have the COVID-19 company, but we do have companies involved in vaccines, really exciting vaccines or important vaccines, um, vaccines that are using new types of technologies, but also with with conditions that are kind of uh, second nature to develop countries, but are still a really, really big deal in a country like China. Oh, uh, so th that would be, and of course, COVID-19 has had a silver lining in China indirectly with some of our, more particular our later stage companies. Like we have a company called Coyote, which is um, founded actually by a few returnees, and they are really just blazing a huge opportunity this past year because of point of care diagnostics. Um, it's one of the mega trends we have in China. Okay. China- Point uh, of care diagnostics. Yeah, that, that, that definitely, yeah. I mean, that would, it's something that can be very useful in today's environment. Um, so what was this deal that you just did uh, a few days ago um, in the healthcare space? Oh, uh, uh, before that, Rebecca, I think a uh, one audience called Mike was asked a question about. Uh, no, I want to ask you about your healthcare deal first. Let me yeah, handle yeah. the questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Because we just closed a new round of anchor anchor docs. Do you want to talk about that one, Fiona? Um, uh, anchor doc. You mean. Yeah, or we just closed. Uh, I think we, we we closed yesterday, right? Anchor doc. What is it? What does it do? Uh, this uh company um. Is doing early stage. Uh, is doing early detection for cancer um, um, across all the uh, uh, all kinds of cancers. Uh, they are doing the similar things with um, with uh, a, a couple of listed company and uh, uh, acquisition uh, opportunities. Like uh, what is the name of the company was bought by Alumna? Oh, uh, um, you mean Grail. Gra. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just um, lost my uh, memory for for one second. So we have another portfolio called uh, a Burning Rock, which went public last June. And Burning Rock is doing uh, companion diagnostics and early detection uh, R and D for cancer uh, for cancer patients. And uh, Anchor Doc is uh, focusing their technology to do um, uh, early detections. They're, the first product will be launched uh, or later this year and uh, will be the first uh, uh, one, the first or second one company in China. And they are doing their clinical trials uh, both in China and in the US. Uh, we are very confident that they will be the uh, first wave of the companies to launch the early detection products. I see. Yeah. We're, we're super thrilled, Rebecca, mm -hmm. um, to a, a number of our, we would like to have as our peers uh, and also our competitors, you know, that's what the industry is like, but a firm called um, Orbimed, which if people in the audience are in the healthcare industry, you know this, it's kind of a well-known name. They led the last round. Uh, prior investors are, it's kind of like a who's who. We're really blessed and honored. Uh, Arch Venture Partners, which is a huge healthcare fund here in the Bay Area, US, Six Dimensions, which is the rebranding of Fidelity, I think. Um, so a lot of uh, firms that we love co-investing with came in on this, on this investment. Um, it's a mega trend that we've, well, I would, I would say mega trend, that's superfluous, but I would super hyperbole, but I would say it's a huge trend, um, next generation sequencing related diagnostics and therapeutics, because in China, Rebecca, um, and I, I'm not an insurance expert, but they call it a single payer system. You pay if you have money, basically. And mm -hmm. so you might have money or your parents or your relatives might have money. Regrettably, you might have cancer, but you shouldn't use that and buy that drug if it doesn't work for you. And so you need that gene testing to know if that's going to be helpful or not. Yeah. 
Well, we we'll, we've focused a lot on your healthcare deals, but I'm curious to know what percentage of your deals are in the healthcare space. It's about what? one third. It's only one third of them. Okay. Uh, what about these other sectors that you're in, SaaS and? Um, we are, we're we're pretty trying. excited about a recent round that we uh, got a uh, uh, yeah. lead called <clears throat> Shin Ha Yoon. Um, new Ha Cloud. I actually don't remember what the Ha is in Shin Ha Yoon, but it's basically a new cloud. Uh, it means new cloud, and it's part of our huge mega theme, Rebecca, about ch the China is the manufacturing basket of the world. But uh -huh. labor and costs have gone up a lot. The RMB right. has gotten much more more valuable, and yeah. so technology and software disruption is incredibly important for manufacturing. So Shin Yun, super honored for my partner Figo, our partner Figo, to partner with IDG to help um, SMEs, which should not be underestimated. SMEs drive. If you've ever been to Alibaba.com or like uh, like uh, AliExpress.com or any of these sites. It's all SMEs in Guangzhou or Fujian. They need amazing ability of software to help create efficiency. And so that's what this company is doing by offering solutions to automate, do supply chain management, connect with self, with the distribution channels. Uh, we find that to be an amazing opportunity. Another company that we're super excited about is called uh, Xiao Eyes. That's kind of half consumer, half enterprise. It's a spin out of Microsoft Asia. It is uh, Xiao Eyes, who is, I actually called it a person. It's, we consider it to be one of the top two or three sentient artificial beings out there. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a venture led by a, a man named Harry Shum, who, use, um, who is to be the head of Microsoft Asia. And we're super excited to be the only VC investor until now alongside NetEase and Microsoft. Oh, wow. Very yeah. exciting. So what what about uh, this post '90s thing that I caught my imagination? What is that? All, what is that all about? Can you name a couple of companies in that space? Um, we um, uh, maybe uh, Picky was one. Oh yes, I love. Yes, I was just thinking about <laughs> yeah, a couple of Picky others. Picky was one, right? I'd love to talk about Picky. I was just thinking about a couple of others that. I think about I think about a, maybe one from China or the U.S. What what's one sure. in the U.S. Um, well, let me talk about Picky first, uh, which actually is based in the U.S. Because one of the first things we did when we found Picky was to flip it and then turn it into a U.S. corp. Um, but Picky is all about uh, the post '90s generation globally, about huge mega trends we're seeing in usage models that China is first in the world. A, a couple of names that come to mind obviously is like Kuaisho and and uh, and um, and TikTok and ByteDance. But then you see companies like Xiao Hongshu and cons uh, Chinese consumer brands that are coming up. You apply that to the world, you apply that to Gen Z or the post nineties, and you realize that discovery allows that long tail to be incredibly powerful when you aggregate that. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of opportunity. You don't need to look at Amazon. And in fact, Gen Z does not want to go to Amazon. Amazon is boring. It's what your parents do. It's like Facebook, you know? <laughs> it's where your, gra your grandparents post photos of your kid, I mean, of their grandkids, no offense. I actually use Facebook, so it totally belies my age. But um, but that's what Picky is all about. It's about discovery, about trust. And then we think that all the other building blocks are out there, whether it's Shopify, whether it's um, you know uh, Lazada or any of the other sites, Coupon. We think the platform for people to buy something is there. It's just about finding it and trusting that what you found is something that you want to buy. Mm -hmm. That's what Picky is all about. But they're only doing beauty. They started with K-Beauty because that's an amazing wave. Thank goodness to Netflix. Netflix just announced yesterday they're investing a, hundred, a half a billion dollars in one year on buying new Korean content. Every time one of those things become huge global successes, people want to know how you can have, I don't know, the same skin. And that's sure. been a great driver for Picky. That's what sure. our feature <laughs> So, uh, so you mentioned like you you, uh, you wouldn't do Facebook, you would you wouldn't do uh, you know uh, Twitter or this or that in in China. What would you do? WeChat. I mean, what is what is the main shopping engine now in China? Is it for, still Alibaba? For post is it still an Alibaba? For post nineties, for post nineties well, generation, or yeah, us? Let's talk, yeah, let's talk about the new wave. Yeah, why not? Okay. Let's talk about I'm gonna I'm wave. gonna I'm gonna challenge Fiona because she's gonna have to act hip and cool now. 
Fiona, tell us what is the hot post 90s generation to buy and experience things. I'm a post 80. I force myself to be a to be approaching post 90 habit in the past year. Uh, I'll, I'll try. So uh, Alibaba is still the uh, biggest engine, um, and uh, you are uh, people rely on uh, Jingdong JD uh, highly heavily for grocery shopping, and uh, for post 90s they use a lot Xiaohongshu, uh, uh, which is probably China's version of Instagram. And uh, they used uh, uh, Douyin and Kuaishao, which is China version to uh, TikTok, to buy things. They they are selling things uh, uh, by their broadcaster. Um, so this is a really good example where China is leading trends, you know, that are going global. This Kuaishao, that the fact that they're shopping on a TikTok type platform in China, uh, that's ahead of what we have here in the U.S. It's it is, but it do is people ahead. buy things on TikTok in U.S. as well? No. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, weigh in here. I'm not a... Well, not yet. Uh, well, but I, I can tell you from my personal experience, my son who's in high school scares me because he bought like breakfast cereal on Instagram. Like someone was promoting a breakfast cereal and he bought it. And I was like, why would you buy something that goes in your body that you would eat from that? But that's just a total different thinking. Why not? It's a it's an influencer I trust. It's right. more I trust it more than Safeway. I definitely right. trust it more than Amazon. So it's yeah, kind of than, a, than a paid TV commercial or a paid commercial somewhere, right? Yeah, it's, it's coming totally from incredible. a trusted source. Uh, okay, all right. That's this is fun. Uh, let's see what kind of questions we have in here. Uh, all right, uh, Mike Weiss would like to know. Uh, Mike Weiss is actually uh, recording. Uh, he's going to be doing a snapshot summary of this um, discussion here. So uh, stay tuned for that. That'll be in our newsletter on Monday. So thank you, Mike, for your question. Mike Weiss, do you have examples of portfolio companies that have had to pivot their business due to the onset of COVID? That's a good question. Uh, yeah. I'll take the, what, this one first. Uh, that's why I uh, mentioned the uh, question earlier when uh, Jeff uh, uh, mentioned a company called Coyote, because uh -huh. Coyote is a perfect example of this question. Coyote is doing uh, 30 minutes quick POCT uh, testing for, um, for COVID, and uh, they uh, got their products approved very quickly in, la in April last year which allowed them to put their machines in a carry-on carry on, uh, luggage size to the airport, to the hotel, which allows people to do 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes DNA testing for COVID. Uh, their business uh, increase, I think, rose at uh, 300 percentage last year compared with the previous year, uh, which brought them directly to IPO this year. Mm -hmm. Did you have any companies that really struggled during COVID, and you thought, well, maybe they wouldn't get, they weren't going to make it unless they changed strategy somehow? Well, we have one that was super scary. Um, actually, it was in the news a few about a month ago. It's called um, I want to pry my I'm, I'm rusty because I haven't been to China in a year, even mm -hmm. though I have to converse with all my colleagues in Chinese. Uh, Huo Hua Huo Hua So Huo Hua Sue is the math company. Uh, that we invested in, uh, our partner Lin Lu, who we're so excited. I hope you get to meet him soon, and your your viewers get to meet him. He's the guru of online education investing in China, I believe. But it's a math focused company. Uh, Kwai Show just led the last round. Before that, we had friends from Sequoia and GGV come in. There, um, they used to have their teachers. In short, it's one on one teaching or one to many, one to small group teaching for kids in math. Their big center was in Wuhan. And during the lockdown, people could literally not, obviously not leave their apartments. And so the company had to scramble to actually equip their teachers with what we're probably all using right now, a laptop or a computer with maybe a headset to be able to do this. So on a dime, they had to completely pivot to a totally distributed uh, workforce basically. And and then also deal with network issues because China is, um, for those of you in the audience who are network gurus, China is like the worst place with network internet peering in like the whole world. Like it's like, it's like the three kingdoms, but it's internet. So it's really, really hard for an internet company 
which by the way, Rebecca, is one of our secret weapons, one of our superhuman strengths for our value add. It's very hard for a Chinese internet company to scale nationwide. It's not trivial to offer uh, amazing service to third and fourth tier cities or the countryside. And if you have a problem with your service because of bad internet and bad user feedback, then your brand can die overnight. So it's, it's one of those areas that we feel very strong as a technologically very deep firm, that that's something that we can do. We may not know all the powerful Wall Street brokers, although we think we can meet them if we want to, but we don't care because we want to be the technological support if possible for the entrepreneurs. Is that what you meant by the bones? Exactly. In fact, you know, it is by design and intentional. When you showed how Fiona's background, she has a, a, an undergraduate degree in computer engineering. To us, that's amazing. Because if you think about uh, firms that we honor, like Andreessen Horowitz and uh, Jorge Condon and, and Mark Andreessen and Ben and Ben Horowitz, they talk about applying IT to healthcare, the engineering approach. And to us, that's why Fiona has been one of our secret weapons and now, of course, one of our leaders. Yeah. So Fiona, what's it like being there as a female in China Venture Capital? Do you ever think about that or it's not an issue or it is an issue or what do you think about it? Um, thank you for um, asking this question. I uh, never thought about uh, we're going to discuss on this session. Uh, it's great. Um, I'm a female. It's a very okay. dynamic conversation. <laughs> Anything goes. I know. <laughs> I, um, I'm a female. I uh, had 16 deals in the past seven years with Northern Light, uh, made partner from intern uh, associate until now. But I also had two boys uh, in the last six years. The youngest, the younger one is only 16 months. Um, so uh, I don't want to put your question as an issue or not issue perspective because you right. never solve it if you see it as an issue. Right. I just want myself to know what I really want. I'm very confident that I want my career. I want to be work together with the entrepreneurs. I want to be a important brick in, in the uh, China's healthcare development in the industry. But I also want to have my personal life, have uh, my mother role, have my family. I want both. I don't know what other things I can sacrifice, but I definitely know I want the both. So I just make it happen. So that's how I'm right, I, right. my life. But uh, you, I mean, you've been given a great opportunity there at Northern Light Venture Capital and they just made you partner. So uh, uh, any comment about that? Um, uh, uh, rule of thumb, I think I agree with the philosophy and value of the firm and the founding partner, uh, Feng, Deng Feng is the technology gonna change the world. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, that's why I work with the team. I work for the firm, for the LPs, and work with the entrepreneurs because I, I, I deep in mind, I grow with the value. Okay. So I'm, I'm excited with the opportunity and, uh, and excited to be the uh, very first female partner at the firm. Very and good. And the very female partner in the industry. Yeah, I know. And I think China has more uh, percentage wise than the US does. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting um, dynamic for sure. Yeah. And the, I always and notice the, that, that there's many more female VCs um, doing deals than, than there are here in Silicon Valley or New York or Massachusetts or wherever we might be. Um, but okay. So there's a few more questions that came in. Uh, what kind of entrepreneur portraits do you see the most important when you invest? Uh, like, what is it about an entrepreneur that uh, causes you to invest? And do you see any difference between the China and the Korean entrepreneurs? Uh, I'll, I'll take that, give, uh, give Fiona a chance to reflect and, and reflect, which was an amazing, I'm, I'm just touched by what you said, Fiona. So thank yeah, you no, me too. Time. Actually, I, 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 yeah, it was it was an uh, excellent answer. I'm very Amazing. Um, for me, and I think it shared by many of my partners, is we care about the the um, the original essence, the what drives this person and why they're doing this startup, what what drives their passion, and also what they see about society, their societal view. 
we definitely want to have people who are optimistic about the positivity of, of entrepreneurship and about just innovation to society. Uh, we don't want people who are there just to make a quick buck or a big buck and try to make a fortune as quick as possible. I will be very open about that to people. Uh, we definitely make that a big filter. Um, we think that there's some amazing people that are become the giants uh, the sh and we're on the shoulders of giants of the Chinese tech industry and healthcare, also in Silicon Valley. But it is about what drives them internally, what, what really gets them up every morning, especially in times of hardship. Difference between China and Korea, um, you know, and once again, I don't want to go into detail about the cultural historical background, but I would say that in, in contemporary China today, we see uh, much less cultural hesitation to uh to focus on opportunities and what it means to be an entrepreneur i think korea has amazing cultural energy and vibrancy that is is singular in the world today on earth but there's also a, which is a, a double-edged sword a lot of great traditions you know many of them from china including confucian traditions which sometimes get in the way of i think really just ripping off the band-aid so to speak i uh -huh. think that's kind of the two differences i would say the nuance about both markets i see okay um, all right, here's another healthcare question. Is there any pitfall to avoid you advise uh, early career investors in investing into healthcare when everyone's attention is on the uh, sector more than ever? Um, like, is there too much money chasing too many, uh, too few healthcare deals now? Is it the valuation is getting huge in healthcare now? Or what are, what are kind of the pitfalls you have to avoid now in healthcare investing? Um, number one, um, uh, choose the right partner. Uh, investor is not only investor. Investor is your long journey partner. Mm -hmm. um, choose the right one. Sometimes they are not give you the highest uh, valuation or the best terms but you you you, you better uh, choose somebody to who share the same value towards entrepreneur towards the industry and your company um, number two um, be realistic be calm um, the market cannot be that as heated as forever uh, just just be prepared uh, get enough money, get sufficient capital and talent for a company to spend the winter possibly in the future. Right, right. Do you, do you think that we're coming out of this now? Are we gonna see a real upturn, a real surge now forward? Um, now that you know the vaccines are getting out there, COVID seems to be on on the downside now um are you are your companies prepared for a burst of energy now are you prepared for a burst of energy now i i, I just think it's coming that's how i feel about it i feel like oh my god i better get ready now because uh, come you know next month even I, you know I, I even see it here in my neighborhood now you know delivery trucks and electricity trucks and uh, plumbing trucks and people moving in and out none of this was happening a few months ago now it's all happening so are you are you prepared for <laughs> what comes next well definitely um when Fauci says that he, he's okay and he's pretty conservative i think he's okay with people who are vaccinated to congregate indoors that's like a big green light for me um uh -huh. we're super excited i'm super excited about the next decade i mean I wish we had a decade. I'm afraid it's gonna be a little bit shorter than that, but a lot of people talk about the roaring 20s and how this is a parallel. As long as someone tells me when is our 1929, I'm, I'm, I'm off the races, you know? Um, uh, but we, I think we see early signs of that. Uh, we are so optimistic about the regions and the strategies that we're playing with. We're optimistic about China, about Silicon Valley. I'm personally optimistic about Korea, as I mentioned. We love consumer enterprise and healthcare. Where we're gonna play is early stage. Um, it's what gets us out of bed every morning and comes to work and come to work every morning. It's those calls. We wanna be that person. I told you this before, when when that name, when my name pops up on my smartphone and that entrepreneur sees it, they're like, oh God, he called. No, oh, he called, I wanna take that call. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of uh, venture capital firm and, and partners that we wanna be to entrepreneurs. We wanna be there for people even if it's not the best of times. 
So are you real driven by new technologies and new innovations that are coming out there and like new patents for the next new thing? Is that something that you focus on or are you just focus more on the entrepreneur? We are focused on, on, on specific mega trends that are definitely technological, but are also advancing society. So we're definitely very much in alignment with where we think humanity and um, modern civilization wants to take society. We like smart cities. We like, um, we like more intelligent uh, communities uh, through the use of AI or 5G or IoT. We like healthcare, helping to improve the lives of, of people around the world, but certainly in the markets that we focus on, which is the US and China. Um, so I, I guess that would be our answer. We, I mean, yeah. I do personally cover and look at and study um, quantum networking and quantum computing, but I don't think that's something where we as a firm, early stage particularly, should like build an investment thesis around, not now. Yeah. It's too soon, huh? Yeah, yeah. I okay, think so. what about 6G? Um, are you excited about 6G? Or is that- oh, no. I got a five, I, I gotta tell you one thing about, about Korea in closing. I got a 5G phone. I got a couple of 5G phones. Yeah. I don't know if this is how we all felt in 2002, 2003 when Steve Jobs first came out with the uh, iPhone, but all I was doing was like downloading large files and say, wow, that was fast. I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like, how is this changing my life? So I guess it's gonna change our life and maybe another 10X a TikTok will show up, but I don't know right now what that will be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we'll have the one second TikTok then because we could <laughs> squeeze everything into one second. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, so where do you think the next new thing will come from? Any particular market that you are high on versus another? Well, if we had to choose the three, we're we're very bullish about China okay. as a as a melting pot and a hotbed. Uh, okay. Just the population, the market growth, the urbanization, just the sense of destiny and excitement that people have, and the challenges. We do see a lot of challenges. We see the rapid aging of Chinese society. Something that we want to help be part of the solution. We know that the low birth rate due to the one China policy is going to create some demographic issues that are not going to be alleviated overnight. That's another opportunity we want to, a challenge we want to be able to part to solve, things like that. I see, I see. All right. Well, that's uh, interesting. So is the US falling behind? Uh, <laughs> maybe this is a good time to launch my uh, poll here to ask is, is the US uh, falling behind? Okay, we're going to launch our polling now where everybody gets to weigh in anonymously over some wise questions and some silly questions too. Uh, so, all right, uh, I hope everybody can see this here. Um, when do you think we can travel internationally again? And Jeffrey, I was gonna ask you that too. When do you think you'll go back to China again? Um, but uh, when do you think we can travel internationally again? Everyone um, weigh in with your answer, all right. All right, the next question is, when do you plan to take your next flight overseas? All right, that's pretty, okay. Have you received your vaccination yet? Okay. Uh, most people haven't yet. Um, do you plan to receive a vaccination? Uh, most people, yes, two thirds, yes. Um, okay, let me go back to these other questions here. Uh, when do you think we can travel internationally again? So about half, say September, 2021. Um, all right, that's the leading answer. Um, when do you plan to take your next flight overseas? 60% say Q3. So third quarter is winning out, uh, not too much before then. Um, okay, and then which hub is the most promising for startup and venture? And this is a real US focused question uh, because we've already talked a lot about um, China and Korea in this session, but uh, most people are really uh, optimistic about uh, Austin in spite of all the problems <laughs> in the last week. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. New York City uh, wins second and um, Miami, uh, not too many, not too many uh, were all that keen on Miami, although I, I've seen uh, Founders uh, Fund set up in Miami and uh, 
you know, a lot of wealthy people are moving to uh, Miami and, um, and um, for uh, tax reasons. So that means that the, uh, the wealth advisors are following them. So I'm going to share the results now so that everybody can see the answers. I, I just think this is a rather fun. Austin really won out by a long margin. Wow. And most people are going to get the vaccine. And most people are going to start traveling again in Q3. And Jeffrey, how about you? Um, when do you expect to go back to China again? Well, that's a technically speaking, I hope to be in Hong Kong in June or May. And in terms of mainland China, Oh, May or June. Okay, you're going to go to Hong Kong in May or June. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In, in mainland China. So what are you doing? Looking for deals there, or what are you doing there? Oh, uh, we have a we have an office there, and we actually, um, uh, you know, maybe, you know, big plug here because I know you mentioned the Hong Kong investment um, promotion people, folks. We're a big, we're very bullish on Hong Kong. I think we have to be for various obvious reasons because we're bullish uh -huh. on China as one of our yeah. regions. Yeah, so we're, we're doing a lot of things there to kind of take advantage of the greater Bay Area. Uh, we're applying for um, we're planning to apply for a type of, for SFC license to be able to be more involved in Hong Kong. Okay. So we're out of there. So I need to get out there. Oh, yeah. very good, very good. Um, and when this this is a question that came in as well. Um, when can we see an NLVC fund active in Korea and outside of China, actually going global market? We question. see that I see that in three in Q3. So in Q3, uh, def, I, I actually very have high confidence on that now because of what we're all seeing every day with the optimism with the vaccine. Yeah. But our plan is to have a, a public launch of something in Korea in Q3. I see. Okay. Yeah. Good. A, a separate fund or, or, or what? An office or what? We yeah. already have an office. Um, have an office we don't really highlight that, but we do have an office in Gangnam. In uh, in Samsungdong, for those of you who are in Korea, uh, we're actually in the COEX, literally. But we're planning on doing something in Korea. We're looking at the DNA of how Greylock and NEA helped us, and we're figuring out how do we help make it the best and most successful with agency. You know, we believe, like many, that VC is a local business, and so, you know, and uh, we're not Jeff Bezos, but you know how Rebecca Jeff Bezos, when he used to work at Amazon, because I know he retired, a meeting should be two pizzas. Should feed two, it should be fed, should be able to be fed by two pizzas. So, you know, those are some of the considerations we have on how to thoughtfully launch into Korea. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, and you also mentioned you're going to uh, travel elsewhere uh, besides Hong Kong. You go back to mainland China as well? I hope so. I mean, um, you know, it's all conjecture on my part, but I'm hoping that one of these travel passports, I hope a lot of us get vaccines. I have one of these passport apps that. The airlines are doing. I hope one of them sticks. Um, I have great faith that United Airlines really wants that to happen, and we can benefit from that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh huh. A, a, a passport with it shows you had the vaccine. Yeah. Then we don't have to do this crazy. I think China has one of the most stringent quarantine procedures of any country I think in the world right now. So. Right. So to go back there, you got to spend two weeks in quarantine, right? Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, you have to have your test first, then you have to, you know, you have to be vaccinated all, as well to go into China? No, but you, you have to be tested right now. And if you actually get a positive antibody result from a, uh, from a blood test, then you can't, you're not admitted. So you have to also prove that you never had COVID. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Never had it. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, and there's a question here about leapfrog opportunities. Uh, so are there any leapfrog opportunities uh, that uh, you can think of um, in the medical field or in, in other in telemedicine and service delivery? Is there some kind of leapfrog? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you, Matt, enough for your question. Leap, leapfrog. leapfrog opportunity. Leapfrog opportunity. Right. Um, which, which you can see the, I, maybe you can see the question here. Which therapeutic areas do you feel are still medically underserved in China? And are there leapfrog opportunities? 
Is it telemedicine, um, specialty services, service delivery, device versus drug? I think uh, there are a lot of under under uh, served uh, therapeutics problem in China, a lot compared with US. Uh, uh, but if you are saying uh, leapfrog opportunity, probably I vote, my vote doesn't go to biotech uh, because it has been relatively crowded uh, in China. Uh, uh -huh. Biotech falling on that as well. Maybe try telemedicine or digital health, which is a, a huge gap uh, between China and the US right now. There are a lot of reasons behind this. Uh, I don't want to um, elaborate too much here, but a, 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 there could be some huge, huge um, opportunities. Okay. Yeah, yeah the, good, thank you. Appreciate that. Well, let's move along because we're running out of time now. Um, and, um, I want to get to our next part of, I think we've done a large number of our um, issues that we wanted to do here today. We did our Q&A, uh, our poll, our, we didn't do a quiz, but um, next time we'll do a quiz. So people, uh, a reminder about Silicon Dragon Circle, um, if you sign up, you get our events for the year. Uh, and our next one is with Catherine Hoff, Stephen Hoffman, founder of Founderspace. Uh, he's also an author. He's got a new book coming out. So it's going to be interesting for everyone to hear what he has to say. That's March 18th. And then after that, we have Tom Kosnick from Founders X Ventures. Um, I met Tom as, uh, around the Stanford campus. Um, he's always mentoring students and very popular, very extremely prop popular, and he's become a venture capitalist now. Uh, and he is deeply involved with the Silicon Valley China sphere. So that's going to be good. That's our one that's going to be March 31st, last day of the month. Uh, again, 4 p.m. Both of these are 4 p.m. on Thursday, uh, at least in the U.S. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, special thanks to Invest Hong Kong for your series support. Um, and um, please um, check us out online. Uh, join the Silicon Dragon Circle so you can come to all of our events for the year. And um, I would like to say a special thanks to Fiona and to Jeffrey for joining us. And uh, thanks to our audience for the great questions. Uh, please look for our newsletter on Monday where, where we will have a recap of the uh, points that were made, the main points that were made. And thank you to Mike Weiss for doing that for us. Um, so. Again, um, one last thing, <laughs> one last thing, which is our toast. Uh, for you people in China, sorry, I'm drinking, I'm going to drink wine now, but <laughs> I think you have your coffee is. over there. <laughs> Fiona has her coffee. I'm not sure what Jeffrey's drinking, but uh, oh, yeah. whatever. <laughs> tea, it looks like tea. Oh, okay, tea. Well, thank you. Thank you again, everyone. And I'll see you um, soon online. Thanks Thank again. Thanks for having us. Yeah. All right, thank you. Right, well, thank you, Rebecca. Bye -bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.